Well, we're in a series called Where Are You Headed? We're all heading somewhere in life. In fact, we're heading somewhere in life on many different paths. You can be on a financial path, you can be on a relationship path, you can be on an educational path, uh, you can be on a spiritual path. And on each in our lives, there are many different paths that we're on. And you might get one path right and yet miss the boat on, uh, on, another, on another path that you're on. And you only need to be really wrong on one path for it to cause some major problems in your life in every other area. So, for example, if you're in, you end up in a, uh, on the wrong financial path, that's going to affect your relationships. It's going to affect what you can and can't do. If you're on the wrong path relationally, that's going to affect many of the decisions that you make in the future. And, um, and so in each of the, uh, the courses that, uh, that you choose to follow, it is going to have a dramatic um, uh, influence on your life and effect on your life. There are going to be consequences to each decision that we make. And so in the first week, we looked at the principle of the path, and, um, and we looked at how it's easy to get lost in life, and, uh, and how we have really a, a bias so often for choosing the wrong paths to be on in life. Uh, we don't mean to be on the wrong paths, but it's amazing how often we end up choosing those wrong paths. And we looked at Matthew 7 and uh, about the, the two builders, the wise builder and the foolish builder, um, the fact that there are two teachers in life. There's, we can go through the teacher of wisdom, which is uh, learning ahead and, uh, and, and being able to, to learn from maybe from others. And uh, the other one, of course, is consequences. So if you pay the price, uh, if you pay the price of consequences from your decisions, you will still learn, but you're not going to... What I find in life is I haven't got enough time in life to experience everything, to learn from everything that way. It's better that actually we use a better path and we learn from others, and particularly we learn from the Word of God as to the path that we should do. And then the second week, um, we looked at, uh, uh, at two young men and how the importance of us to, when we're making decisions, is to look ahead. Um, if, if possible, to kind of have some binoculars and to look as far ahead as possible. And particularly if you are a, a believer and a follower of Jesus Christ, you need to look ahead with eternity in view. Um, so that is important. So we looked at two young men. We looked at a foolish young man in Proverbs chapter 7. And then we looked at a wise young man in uh, Genesis 37, uh, a young man called Joseph. And so we realize that actually when we have good questions, they help us to make good decisions. And so through this series, we're trying to throw out a few questions that we feel would be worthwhile considering when you're making some decisions in life and you're thinking, which way do I go? Do I go left? Do I go right? Do I go straight on? Whatever it might be. And one of those questions was to ask ourselves, what is the wise thing to do? What would be the wise thing for me to do in this situation? And the second one was, what story do I want to tell? Because our decisions form the story of our life, and for each one of us, our past is our story. And so if we want to change the future and change a story for the future, we have to change the decisions that we are making. So it's a good question to ask ourselves when making a decision is, is this a story that I would like to tell? Is this a story I would like my children to tell about me? And, uh, and so that is, uh, that is helpful from, from that. So our memory verse that we've had through this series is being Proverbs chapter 27 and verse 12. It, the same one is found in Proverbs 22 and verse 3. And that is that a prudent person foresees danger and takes refuge. But the naive or the simpleton goes blindly on and suffers the consequences or we had the JHV version, uh, which was the wise sees danger and takes refuge. The wally has an, outstretched man an ostrich mentality 
I don't know why I said outstretch, ostrich mentality and thinks he can defy the odds but suffers the consequences. So in other words, if we look ahead, we can often foresee things, can't we? And so we looked at that in week two. We looked at the fact that often we can predict our own future if we actually thought about it. And we can so often predict other people's futures because we often would say and say, you know, I should have seen this coming or you should have seen this coming. And when we analyze our, our, our life and the decisions we make, we should really know the outcomes for many of the things. Of course, there are some things we don't know the outcomes for, but, um, but there are some things if we ask the right questions, it would help us. So the key is, what is the key to making good decisions? What would you say is the key to making a right decision? Yes? Well, most people would agree that actually having the right information is the key. So in other words, if you know the right thing to, to, you know, you have enough knowledge, you have enough understanding of the situation, then you can make a right choice. And of course, we understand that. So for example, if you're in a uh, you're in your workplace and you're, you need to make a choice on something and you think, well, okay, if I use this mathematical formula, this will help me to make a right choice. Or, you know, there's, there's all sorts of things. There's some things that are just um, uh, are often plain choices because of the information you have. But because of your information, you can make a good decision. And so we would often think of that in our life so often in the choices of our life that if we have enough good information that we will make the right choices yes and uh, and so this is uh, this is a key thing for us because i've often thought this thought if i just knew enough i would make the right choice but actually i've learned that i've seen a lot of smart people make stupid mistakes Anybody know anybody who's smart and made stupid mistakes? You're going, that's me. <laughs> We're all thinking, well, yes, I, I, I reckon I'm smart and I've made a lot of stupid mistakes. So in other words, it's not the fact that we didn't know what we should have done. It's the fact that we actually knew what we should have done, but we didn't do it anyway. We chose a different path. And so that's the whole thing of this series is direction, not intention, determines our destination. In other words, you will end up being where the path, where the road, where the lane, where the river, whatever you want to call it, goes. If you're in that river, then you're going where it goes. And so unless you get out of the river, unless you get off the path and you take a different path. And so in every area of our lives, we are on a path. Whether we are intentional about it or not, whether or not it's, it's by uh, design or whether it's by default. So often in life, we go through life thinking that actually, you know, it doesn't matter what decisions we make or we don't connect, as I talked about last week, we don't connect our decision to the consequences. We often think we're the exception to the rule. Don't we? Yeah? And the thing is, is we see people who are the exception to the rule, don't we? In other words, you can see somebody that maybe smokes into their 90s and they don't have a problem. But am I going to advise my children that smoking's okay? Why? Because, well, that person might be an exception to it, but I'm not going to base my life on an exception. The problem is we promote the exception, but we don't promote what is the normal outcome of that, that kind of choice. Is that all right? Yeah. And so this is the issue. So we've got to understand that the path that you are on in your teens is going to have consequences in your 20s. The path you're on in your 20s is going to make and stop you having some choices in your 30s. So in other words, the choices you make early on in life and throughout life are like dominoes 
that if you choose to go left with the dominoes, it has a domino effect and changes what you can. You can no longer go on that path. So in other words, it's so important to us to realize that decisions made in your teens to the teenagers matters. Because we think, oh, I've got my whole life ahead of me. You know, and uh, if this relation doesn't work out, there's no worry, I'll, I, I've got plenty of time to try a different relationship. You know, I don't need to save now because I've got lots of time to save. And so in other words, we think with our own logic and our own perception and we make decisions not realizing that at some point or other, you are going to have the consequences, the results are going to show of the choices that you have made at some point or other. And unfortunately, we are not able to go back and to change those decisions. You see, they might have a time machine in the films, but for you and I, and the reality is, life just keeps moving forward. We don't have an option, and oh, how we wish we could go back and change some of the decisions, the things we did, or the things we said in the past. Is that not, Am I only the one in the place that wants to go back and to change some things? We do, don't we? We want to do that. Now, I don't know if you've ever seen that fairy tale. It's usually on at Christmas, and it's called The Wonderful Wizard of Oz. <laughs> And in The Wizard of Oz, of course, it's a plot, it's a classic film, and it revolves all around about Dorothy's desire to go home. Yes, there's no place like home. Yes, well, it depends what's in your... Anyway, but, but there can be. But Dorothy meets Glinda, uh, which is known as the Good Witch of the East. Didn't know you could have a good witch, but there you go. Glinda informs Dorothy that her only option is to seek assistance from the great Wizard of Oz. And the only way she can get this information from the Wizard of Oz is she has to go to the great Emerald City. And so she says, um, Dorothy asks, how do I start for the Emerald City? And Glinda says this, she says, always best to start at the beginning. <laughs> Duh. And all you do is follow the yellow brick road. And that was true. If she followed in this film where the yellow brick road, it led to the Emerald, Emerald City. In other words, if the, do you not wish that there was a yellow brick road for each of the paths in our life? Don't you wish if somebody said, if you just get on that road, you're sorted. Wouldn't be nice if you could just, because, okay, you know, there was all sorts of problems for Dorothy along the way. There was difficulties, there was hiccups, there was dangers, there was all sorts of things she had to go through. But she knew if she stayed on the yellow brick road, she'd get to where she needed to go. The question for us is, life's not that simple, is it? It's not as simple as that. And so we have to understand, wouldn't it be nice if there was a yellow brick road for our marriage? Wouldn't it be nice if there was a yellow brick road for our finances? Wouldn't it be nice if there was a yellow brick road for our relationships? Wouldn't it be nice if there was a yellow brick road for our education? If we just knew the path to follow. But it's not as easy as that, is it? And so choosing our paths is crucial. It's critical, it's important, and yet we feel, yes, but how? How can I choose the right path? How do I know which path to choose? You see, the problem is, is we don't have all the necessary information we need up front. It's not there, yes, for us to have that. And so we don't know the future, and because we don't know the future, we are struggling to know what to do. So, let me give you an example. Surely to goodness, single people shouldn't be the, peop the right people to choose a marriage partner. You say, why is that? Well, for the simple reason, they have no experience with marriage. They don't know what marriage entails. They're single, yes? I'm not, some of you might be single and you've been married and 
So, <laughs> never again. But whatever. But what I'm saying, for those that have never been married, and yet they're expected to make some big decisions about a marriage partner. It's a massive because it sends you on a path. It sends you on a destination. You're going together. There's things that are going to happen as a result of who you're with. In other words, it's probably one of the biggest decisions you'll make outside of giving your life to Jesus. In other words, that, but, but, so single people, could, so surely it should be left to the married people. <laughs> and all the single people are going, no way, Jose, that you are not choosing my partner. <laughs> but, but do you understand the, the process? You see, I, you know, I've thought about this a lot. <laughs> Poor Faith and Nadine. Um, but I've thought about it, though, because, you know, when you're, when you're living through life, you know, I mean, we, we talk, some of you maybe are living, and you've come from, um, from cultures where uh, there is kind of marriages arranged for you, yes? And I've often thought about that. We don't live in that kind of culture, but, but what I'm saying is that, and some of that can be misused, and there's all sorts of problems, we, you know, not, not, no system drive, but what I'm saying is, Thinking about knowledge and thinking about experience, your parents love you and would surely have the best understanding of who would be right for you. <laughs> now, I'm not saying I would want my mum and dad to. <laughs> and mum and dad, if you're listening, the Lord bless you. <laughs> but, 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 but all I'm saying is life is full of firsts. The first time you go to university, the first kiss, the first date, the first marriage, well, hopefully it's the only marriage, but of course, you know what I'm trying to say, the first child, the first investment, the first, life is full of firsts. And the problem with firsts is you don't know often where that's going to lead. You don't understand, you have a child, but what will that entail? Because we don't know the future. We could have a child that's going to be ill and, and, and all sorts of things, and we're going to have to spend our life looking after that child. It changes our life. We might not have planned that. We didn't expect it. We didn't think about it. But actually, we understand then it becomes part of our call to look after them. And so whatever they are, even if they are really bright, really intelligent, and really wise, you're going to have issues as parents. And so we... When you think about the amount of decisions that we have to make and the fact of the lack of knowledge that we have to make those decisions, you would think that when you meet people, that people would be really hesitant to make a decision. People would be fearful of getting the wrong decision, don't you? But I don't see that. I tell you what I see. I see lots of people making decisions oblivious to the obvious. In other words, they're just, they're on, and they're on that path, and they're not thinking about any consequences or anything else. They are just on that path. That's what the path that they want to be on. For the simple reason we're not on a knowledge quest, we're on a happiness quest. So, for example, I like to have a go at the ladies. <laughs> and, uh, and I'm not looking at anybody in particular. <laughs> but... For example, you may have some really good clothes in your closet, in your wardrobe, and you've not worn them for a long while, but, you have, but suddenly you think to yourself, oh, I'm going to go out and do some shopping. So you go shopping for clothes that you don't need because you want something new. Why do you want something new? Because of the way it makes you feel. A new jacket. Whatever it might be. Yes, it's how, why? Because we're on a happy, we're not actually thinking about, is this the right decision? Is this the best use of my money? Is this what I should be doing with what God has given me? We don't think to ourselves, well, actually, if I didn't go shopping this week, I could sponsor a child. If I didn't have all these coffees every week in Costa, <laughs> they've closed Costa's down now, maybe because they've heard me. But anyway... But, but what I'm saying is, is, it's amazing what we could do because, and I'm the same, I'm not, do you know what I'm trying to say is, we're actually on a happiness quest. I want what's going to make me feel good. 
But actually, it is serious stuff, isn't it? Now, let's imagine, and I wish there was this, and I'm sure you do. Can you imagine, because the way it's going anyway, with, with some of the computer stuff, it's absolutely amazing, is can you imagine if there was a database with every decision that has ever been made, say even over the last 100, 150 years, and then every outcome of the decision that was made so that you and I could just go on the computer and go, okay, I want to marry such and such, and then the they'll, they'll computer will come back, well, what is she, and what's her age, and what's she, you know, and upbringing, and is the teeth all right, and whatever. <laughs> do, do, you know what <laughs> do you know what I mean? So, so you've got your kind of thing, and then you could just hit the enter button, and it would come back and go, well, actually, uh, you know, 58,000 people chose that decision and this is what happened. 108,000 people chose that decision and this, wouldn't that be marvellous? We could think, okay, the odds are that if I make this decision, I'm going to have a good outcome. Is that not right? The problem is, is if we had that, we would still ignore it. We would still do our own thing. We would still go, okay, no, no, yeah. But that's not where I want to go. I'm going to take my chance with the, the three there. <laughs> because, unfortunately, information is not enough. Because the issue with that is, is if you are clever enough, if you are smart enough, you will make the right decision. But unfortunately, we can learn from Scripture well, we, fortunately, we can, live from, we can live from Scripture, of what happens when we try to lean on our own understanding. Yes? Because we are smart, and yet we make stupid mistakes. And I believe it's important for us to really think about that. So I want us to look at Solomon. Now, we... Mentioned Solomon last week, Proverbs 7, a little bit. But Solomon was the wisest man who has ever lived. That's what the Bible tells us. And when you look at all that he acquired and who he was and his wisdom, you only have to read one of his books to realize this guy is good. Yeah, he's nearly as smart as your pastor. <laughs> Forgive me for that one, okay. He wrote three books. He wrote Proverbs. He wrote Ecclesiastes. Help me out, come on. Ecclesiastes and Song of Solomon. Okay. Now then, Proverbs is great because it's got 31 chapters, so you can just read a chapter every day. Yes, you've got something there for every day. Now, Ecclesiastes shouldn't be read until you're over the age of 40 or 50. For the simple reason, if you read him when you're young, you're just going to think, this guy's depressed. But when you're over and you've got that thing, you think, oh, this guy's right. <laughs> He's so right. <laughs> I know what he means. I felt it. I'm there. And of course, the Song of Solomon should only be read when you're married. Or if you think the Bible's boring. <laughs> okay. And you're all going home to read Song of Solomon. I can tell, yes. This man had unbelievable wisdom, yes, and insight in every aspect, whether it's science, whether it was maths, whether it was business, whether it was marriage, whatever it was, he had unbelievable insight and knowledge and understanding. And the reason behind this is that when he was made king, yes, he was probably only about 17 or 18 years of age, um, God came to him in a dream and asked him and said, look, I'm prepared to give you anything that you ask for. What would you like? And Solomon, being 17 uh, or 18 years of age, felt the pressure, the awesome responsibility of the kingdom on him, that he was going to rule this empire, and he didn't know how, and he felt inadequate. And so he said, God, the one thing that I would really love to have is wisdom. And so God was so pleased with this answer 
that he said to him, he says, because you've asked for this, I'm not just going to give you wisdom. I'm going to give you wealth. I'm going to give you understanding. I'm going to give you victory over your enemies. You're going to be a peace. You are going to have everything all because you asked for the right thing. I think that's amazing, isn't it? If only I'd done the same, <laughs> is what we're all thinking, aren't we? Yeah. But anyway, so it, it, this is how it, it, it gets into that, yes? So what I'm trying to say is, he becomes the wisest man. So in other words, if ever there is anyone on planet Earth who should know what the right decision to make is, it would be Solomon, would it not? You and I would think, okay, this guy's such a wealth of knowledge and understanding and insight. He, he, he grapples with some of the great things in the things. But when he has asked this question, Solomon says, he says, when you're making a decision, and this is his answer. This is Solomon's answer to the question because I want you to say, I would be, if I was Solomon, I would have probably said, well, considering all my vast experience, and considering the fact that I've got insight into that, and considering that I know best, this is what I would do. That's what we would expect him, wouldn't we? But he doesn't. Proverbs chapter 3, verses 5 and 6, which for some of you may even know, because if you were brought up with memory verses, this is one of the key verses that we all remember. And maybe you can say it. What does it say? Trust in the Lord... With all your heart, lean not on your own, but in all your ways, your paths, acknowledge him, surrender to him, and he will sort the path out. Solomon's saying, and I think this is phenomenal, Solomon's saying that I might be the wisest person in the world, but I'm telling you the best way to know which path to be on is to trust him, is to ask him, is to surrender to him, to acknowledge him and to say, it's all about you. What do you want me to do? Where do you want me to go? How should I choose in this decision? That is phenomenal, isn't it? I don't know. It's not what you would expect. It's a bit mind-blowing, isn't it, to think somebody of this kind of caliber gives us this answer. In other words, what he's trying to say, the answer to life's problems is not a solution. It's not more information. It's not more insight. It's not more experience. The answer is a person. The answer is Jesus. Jesus is the answer. He's the one. And he says, if you will trust me, if you will follow me. The problem is, most people, when they do follow Jesus, follow him because of the happiness, not because of the wisdom. You only need to read John chapter 6. And if you read John chapter 6, and the different guys come up to him and ask him different questions... But what they're really interested in is he had just done a 5K. He just fed 5,000. That was his 5K. And of course, after that, he's just, he's just resting, he's gone aside, and he's trying to kind of, um, you know, come to, come to kind of things. And people, what they do, the people, they think they've just been fed. Ho, oh, ho, this bread was good bread. It must have been Warburton's. Whatever it was, they... They loved the bread. So what did they do? They followed him. They went, they had to go right round because he'd set off in a boat and he'd gone across the lake. And so they had to travel all the way around to get to him to the other side. And their basic thing is, all their questions are leading up to is, how can we get this bread? In other words, how can you, God, sort it so that I don't have to sow anymore, I don't have to harvest anymore, that I don't have to bake anymore, that I can just have what I take so that I can do what you did because I just want to be able to go have some bread. You see, they wanted to make Jesus king. And one of the reasons they wanted to make him king was because kings in them days are the people that supplied the sustenance, the food, the bread. So he was feeding them. So they thought, we'll have him as king. 
because he supplies our needs. And so many people were following him. The crowds were following Jesus because of what he had done for them. But in John chapter 6, particularly as you look to the back of the chapter, you realise there that actually Jesus, some of the guys, they can't cope with this because he's saying, well, I'm the bread from heaven and unless you eat me, eat you, unless you drink of my blood, drink your blood, this guy's crackers. And so they, they don't understand that he's talking in a very different context. He's not talking the physical body. He's talking about spiritually to feed from him. He's talking about, about following him and trusting him and learning from him and, and feeding in that kind of way. And so that's where he goes. So the end of chapter 6 is, is what happens is when they realise that he's not going to play, play their game, what, he do, what they do is... They, de- they desert him. Now, you've, the other thing you've got to remember is when the crowds deserted him and the disciples, they now are their most vulnerable because while the crowds are there, he's protected because they were after Jesus. And so now he's the most vulnerable. So you, so you can imagine the disciples, oh, God, Jesus, let's just, let's just rewind. Let's just, let's, let's just talk about love. Let's just talk about forgive. Let's talk about something else. Let's, let's try to get this back. Do you know what I mean? A bit like what Faith and Nadine do after I preach. They go, oh, if only we could rewind that bit. And uh, do, do you know what I'm trying to say? So, so we, I forgot where I was going. Uh, John 6, keep me on John 6, okay. So basically the, the crowd desert him. But then Jesus turns to the disciples and says, what about you? And the disciples are looking at uh, uh, Jesus and, and, and they're ready to leave. I mean, you know, I don't know about you, but maybe you've been a Christian for a while and you've got to that point where you think, I don't know whether I want to stay on the course. I don't know whether or not this is for me. I don't know, if, do, I, do I really want to give my whole life to this? Yeah? Because that was what was on the, road, on, on the, on the line for the disciples, was it was everything, all or nothing. And, and what's really amazing is, is Jesus said, you, but Peter... He has insight that the others don't. Peter has a revelation and he says, it's like he says, I've thought about this. But then I've thought, you know where you're going. And we know where you're going. But we don't know how to get there. And we know that you know how to get there. So who else, who else has the words of life? Who else has the words of eternal life? Who else should I follow? Who else, if, if not you, who? And that's a good question for every one of us, isn't it, this morning, is to say, if not Jesus, who? Because we are going to follow somebody, and it might just be yourself. It might be a family member, it might be a worker, it might be, I don't know what it might be. Might be Bear Grylls. I don't know. It might be. You might be trying to follow, but I want to say to you: Who you follow will determine your path in life, and whether you, like Solomon, can say, "Trust in the Lord with all your heart." Every path in my life, Lord, I want to surrender to you. I submit to you. I bow to you, and I say, "Lord, your plan." That's a choice: Jesus' way or some other way, and it's a choice today for every single one of us. And I wonder today, maybe you've been a Christian and you, you've walked for a long time, but today you're thinking, you know what? I, have, I, 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 I know I, I said I gave him my life. I know I said I wanted to follow him, but actually there are some areas in my life that I'm still thinking I know best. I'm still thinking that I'm the smartest person in the room. And if that's you today, God is speaking to you to say, will you surrender? Will you say to Jesus today, all I have is yours, all I am is yours, because I know that if I'll follow you and I give you everything that I have, which is not a lot, None of us have a lot in comparison to Almighty God, to how great. The, the, you know, who holds the universe in place, who speaks the word and things come into being. One who holds every part of our life in our hands. Maybe today you've never chosen to follow Jesus. And you've thought, I don't know, I've thought about it. Well, maybe today you could make that choice and say, yes, today I'm going to follow 
I know I don't know it all, and like Solomon, I realize that, that at times I thought I, was, I knew all sorts of things and I was the best at things. But I'm going to take Solomon's advice today. I'm going to heed that advice and I'm going to trust. Now, if you're still undecided and you think, I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm nearly there, I, I think I might, but I just, I just need to know a little bit more. I just need to have some conversations. There are just some things that are questions in my mind. I want to tell you that we have an alpha course. And on the alpha course, that's your opportunity to share your questions and gives, uh, I mean, a lot of the stuff that's on the, on the course answers our general questions. But anything that you have will do that because I want to tell you, there is nothing greater in your life than choosing Jesus. I don't care what other decision, whether it's the house or the car, uh, you know, or whether it's your marriage partner or whether it's the kids or anything else, there is no other greater decision on a daily basis than to choose Jesus. My question today is, who will you lean on? Are you going to lean on yourself? Are you going to lean on... We all lean on somebody or something. Some of us try to lean on ourselves, don't we? We think we, we're good enough, we're strong enough, we've, we've got enough... You know, I'm emotionally strong. Nothing bothers me. You know, and, and sometimes we, we, we can look at other people and think they're like that. But when you get to know the real person, you realize actually all of us are broken people. And broken people need support. We need help. We need somebody through that. Would you today follow Jesus? Amen.